teaching on the power of faith-filled words. And as I said at the very beginning of this, I have mentioned this and talked about it on numerous occasions, and I refer to these kind of things, but I very seldom actually teach on all of that. And so this week, I have just been teaching on this, and I'm going to make a series out of this so that uh, when I refer to something about the power and in your words, I'll be able to have a tape set and people will be able to get it and get it more in depth. But, you know, we've seen a lot of great miracles happen just because of people beginning to understand the power of God's word and the power of God's word in our mouth when we speak. And so last night I was building up to Mark chapter 11, verse 23. And remember the background of it was that Jesus had cursed the fig tree. His disciples heard him say it. And in the morning, 24 hours later, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. It was instantly dead, but it took about 24 hours for the words that were spoken to have a visible effect on that. Boy, that's a powerful truth, and I talked about that. And here's how Jesus told his disciples, how he responded to them when they were shocked over seeing the uh, fig tree withered away. He said in Mark chapter 11... And in verse uh, 23, he says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. That is a powerful passage of Scripture. And again, everything I've said is built up to this. The word that God spoke out of his mouth is what created the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe. That's the power of his words. That's how he released his faith. And then he spoke these words. We use scriptures over in 2 Peter chapter 1 that every word is God breathed. It was inspired and spoken through men. How that Paul said that you receive the word as it is in truth, not the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. That these are God's words. And when we take God's word and begin to speak it out of our mouth, it has this creative power in it that God used to uh, create the universe. We gave examples of how Jesus marveled at a man's faith who was able to just say, you speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. I don't have to have you come and lay your hand on him. I don't have to have you come into my house. He had faith in the word of God. And Jesus said that was the greatest display of faith he had ever seen. I contrasted that with Thomas, who said, unless I see, unless I'm able to put my finger into the print of the nails, I will not believe. Man, those are some powerful things we've already talked about. And so here's Jesus telling how he was able to do this. And again, he's emphasizing the power of words. There's three times in this verse that he said, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things that he says come to pass, he will have whatsoever he says. Well, this is important. Your words are how you release your faith. And you've got to start speaking faith-filled words. And notice it says you have to believe that the things you say come to pass. I've already made reference to this briefly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this this morning. But it's important that you recognize you have to get to where you believe what you say comes to pass. And you can't do that if you are constantly saying things that don't that you don't mean and you don't fulfill your word and you don't even make an attempt to fulfill your word. This is how most people live. They'll say they'll be someplace at a certain time and that doesn't mean that they'll do it. It just means I'm going to try. It'll be somewhere around there. You listen to other people speak lies. We take everything we hear on the, on the news, on the television, and we get to where we train ourselves that words aren't important. You're going to have to change this. You're going to have to get to where when you say something, you believe it. You don't say anything unless you mean it. You don't just speak things. You don't listen to other people speak lies. 
You have to get to a place where you believe that what you say comes to pass. Boy, that is very, very, very important. And this is a lifestyle change. It's not just something where you come and have somebody lay their hands on you and you go out and everything is okay. You have to start training yourself and it's going to take a change. You're going to have to get to where you mean what you say. I've had people come to me before and say things about how do you think I look in this? You shouldn't ask me that. Unless you really want an honest opinion, because I'm not going to lie. I will try and be diplomatic. I have told people before, I said, you don't want my opinion. I'm nobody. Go ask somebody else. And I've tried to deflect it. But you know what? If a person just presses, I'll say, man, you really look fat in that. That really looks bad. Uh, You know, you're having a bad hair day. I'll tell you the truth. I don't mean anything bad by it. But I've just gotten to where I'm going to tell people what I think. And there's a lot of you that won't do that. You just have been trained. You'll just flat out lie to a person. (laughs) I don't guess you guys probably have seen this, but over in the United States, they have a commercial on the television about GEICO. You all have those commercials over here? Anyway, it's an insurance company. And... uh, They'll ask these questions about, can GEICO really save you 20% on your insurance? And then they'll, they'll put up some absurd thing like, you know, where have you been? Living under a rock or something like this. And one of their commercials is about Abe Lincoln, the president of the United States. And he was famous for always telling the truth. And so they say, well, GEICO save you 20%. And then they show Abe Lincoln and they say, was Abe Lincoln really honest? And his wife, they have this person that's really fat. And she says, does this make me look fat? And he goes, well, maybe. Uh, <laughs> it's really funny. But anyway, that's the way that I am. I didn't maybe present that as well as it was. But it, it's really funny. And, you know, that's the way I am. If you ask me something, I'm going to tell you the truth to the best of my ability. And you have to get to where... You don't say things that you don't mean. You don't lie. You don't misrepresent things. That doesn't mean you're supposed to be rude. But at the same time, you just got to get to where you believe that what you say is going to come to pass. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, most people today have been taught basically not to be honest like this. We've been taught to misrepresent things, to lie about people, to say whatever it takes to bless people. I was talking to the youth last night. And you know what? They, one of the questions that they had was about persecution and being ridiculed for being a Christian. And they're, they were struggling with how do they cope with this and should they be open with their witness and stuff. And I just learned to be who I am, even if who I am isn't right. You've got to be honest. You've got to be real about who you are. You've got to do this in your relationship with God. Sometimes you just have to tell the Lord, Father, I want to be full of faith, but right now I'm just not there. Amen. And you've got to be honest. He knows these things anyway. You've got to get to where you, you're honest. When I'm introduced, you know, this is amazing to me, but when I'm introduced in, into a new group of people, the dominant thing that they'll say nearly every time is that he's exactly the same in private, as you see him on TV, or he's exactly the same. And I think, what is everybody else? <laughs> that just amazes me. But this is the number one way that people introduce me, and it's just because I'm exactly the same. And I guess other people aren't the same. Other people are able to put on a religious front and stuff. You've got to get to where you operate in integrity. Where you say the truth, you get to where you, when you say something, you mean it and you are going to do it and you will do it regardless of the consequences. You know, not too long ago, we had a project in the United States where I moved into this 110,000 square foot building. Only 10,000 square foot was really usable and the rest was a warehouse and I was going to fix it up. And I had to take out a $3.2 million loan to do it. And when I built the, bought the building, the banker told me, he says, we wouldn't have given you the money for the building if we hadn't have already approved that we'd give you this construction loan. 
And so they said, it'll only be a week or so, and you'll have your money to start construction. Nine months later, we still didn't have that money. And we had been frustrated, and we met with the banker, and he says, you know, it's been nine months. Let's just start the whole process over. Let's go get another evaluation. And all I could see was another nine months. And I said, I'm not going to do this. And so I started praying, and it's a, it's a long story. I could share a lot of things about this, but the Lord spoke to me. And said, I don't want you to take out a loan. I want you to just trust me for the money. Your partners are the bank. And your partners will enable you to do this without going in debt. And I really felt like that was God speaking to me. But you know, I spent about two weeks praying about it. Because if I told my partners that I wasn't going to take out a loan, then I wasn't going to take out a loan. And I I remember telling Dave. I told him, I said, if tomorrow these banks that we've tried to get a loan from were to come back to me and tell me that they're going to loan me the full $3.2 million, I won't take it. If I say that this is what God told me, this is what we will do. And at at that time, the way the money was coming into our ministry, I sat down and figured it out. And we had just expanded and nearly doubled our television expense. And so if money had come in at the same rate that it had been coming in the year or two previous to that, it would have taken me over a hundred years to come up with this $3.2 million extra. Our ministry would have been totally destroyed. But, you know, I felt like that's what God told me to do. So I told David, I said, you know what, this is what God says. This is what we're going to do. And God's going to supply our need. And I said, I don't care if they come back and offer me all the money I need. Did you know that the very next day, a bank contacted me and says, we're going to loan you $4 million instead of $3.2 million. And I said, you're too late. <laughs> and I turned it down. And I said, I won't do it. And, you know, there's a lot of people that, honestly, you would make a decision. And then if it turned around and something else worked out, you'd just change. You can't do stuff like that. You can't do that and see the miraculous power of God operate. If God tells you something, and if you say God told you this, then you just do it. And somebody says, but this happened. Doesn't matter. Just do it. If it hair lips the devil, do it. You just do it. You do what God tells you to do. You say what you mean. You mean what you say. And if you don't get to a place where you have that integrity, your heart knows it. You know, the scripture says your own heart knows, the heart knows its own bitterness. You know in your heart whether you're a person of integrity. You know in your heart that when you say, by stripes I'm healed, whether you really believe that or if you're just saying it. Your heart knows this. And if you don't keep your word, then when you start trying to speak faith-filled words and say, in the name of Jesus, I can do this, I have this, I am healed or whatever, your heart doesn't bear witness. And the scripture says in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You have to put together your heart and your mouth have to be in agreement. This is the reason why people say so many stupid things about, well, I, you know, that tickled me to death. This scared me to death. And the reason you don't fall over dead is because you didn't mean that from your heart. So if you don't mix faith with it from your heart, then the words don't carry that power. And the sad thing is we say so much stupid stuff that we don't really mean, it confuses your heart. You get to where you aren't really believing things with your heart, and it keeps those words from having their full impact. But this is a powerful passage of Scripture. Jesus, when he spoke to that fig tree and said, No man eat fruit of you hereafter forever, he believed it with all of his heart. There was zero reservation, and because of it, that fig tree died instantly and within 24 hours the results were manifest. If you want that kind of results in your life, start saying the truth, start speaking only the truth and do what you say, mean what you say, don't violate it. That is really profound. And yet a lot of people will not do this. You need to get to where you're serious. Amen? 
And let me point this out. This is really a powerful point here in Mark chapter 11. He said, whosoever shall say unto this mountain. This is a point that a lot of people miss. A lot of people will take the word and they'll start speaking to God and say, God, I believe that I am healed. I believe that my finances are blessed. I believe that you are for me. And they will speak this in prayer to God. That's a good thing to say. There's nothing wrong with saying that. But that's not what the Lord told us to do here. He said, whoever will say unto the mountain. And in this situation, the mountain is your problem. Whatever it is that's standing in your way. Whatever it is that is blocking you. It could be financial poverty. It could be sickness, it could be fear, it could be depression, it could be all kinds of different things. Whatever your problem is, Jesus told us to speak to the problem, not speak to him about the problem. Boy, this is major. Major difference. You know, without saying it, a lot is implied in this passage of Scripture. This is implied the authority that we have as believers. That we can take his word and we can literally enforce his word. The scripture says that in James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You resist the devil. He flees from you. Satan has already been defeated by God. There is no battle between God and the devil. Satan is a defeated foe. But Satan is coming to us with doubt and unbelief and all of these things. And we have to resist him. You can't ask God to resist the devil for you. You can't say, oh God, please heal me. Which is a common prayer that people pray. The Lord said he gave you power to heal the sick. And there is not a single time in the New Testament where he asked you to pray for the sick. There are examples of people praying for the sick. It says in James chapter 5, if anybody's sick, call for the elders of the church and let them anoint him with oil and pray over him and the prayer of faith will save the sick. I'm not saying that praying for the sick is wrong, but we aren't commanded to pray for the sick. We are commanded in Matthew chapter 10 verse 8 and in Luke chapter 9, we are commanded To heal the sick, not to pray for the sick. The body of Christ as a whole hasn't understood our authority. And so the way we do things, we come and we say, oh God, would you please heal me? And then we tell him how desperate it is. The doctor says, I'm going to die. This is happening and this is happening. And we try and make it sound really pitiful so that it'll move God and make him do something. The truth is, by his stripes, you were already healed. Jesus has already done everything about healing you that he's going to do. His part's over. He is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is not healing people today. He's already done it. And he put this healing power on the inside of us. And the way we get it out isn't by saying, God, would you heal us? It's by us saying, Father, thank you that you gave me this power. And now I take my power and authority and sickness in the name of Jesus. I command you to get out of my body. There's not very many people that take that approach. Most people go and ask God as if he's done nothing. God's already done his part. He put this power on the inside of you. And you have to take your authority and speak to the mountain, whatever it is. And you have to tell it to leave. You know, this is really simple, but so many people miss this. You know, I've shared this example before. Some of you have heard it, but it's it's to me the classic example of this. Uh, I had a situation in Charlotte, North Carolina, and there was a woman who uh, I was staying at their home. She watched my video of Nikki Oshinsky's healing, and Nikki Oshinsky was sent home to die. And she was less than a week away from death and she was instantly healed, got up and started walking. And it's a powerful, powerful testimony. So while I was out during the day, this woman had watched that. And when I got home, she was just sitting there crying. And she says, that's one of the greatest things I've ever seen. And she says, I've got a friend who has been in constant pain for, I think it was either seven or nine years and said, uh, I was wondering if you would pray for her. And I said, sure. And says, well, she's on her way over here. She'll be here in 10 minutes. And so this woman came in and it's a, it's a long story, but the short version is she had had constant pain. 
for either seven or nine years. And for about four or five years before the doctor said she couldn't live more than a month, they had pronounced that she was dead. And the way she had been able to cope with the pain, she had magnets strapped to her body and she sewed magnets into a blanket. And somehow she wrapped herself in this blanket and the magnetic field somehow or another helped her pain. The doctor said that on a scale of 1 to 10, her pain was a constant 11. And she had just been completely incapacitated for years and years. She was years past the date that they said that she would die. So anyway, she came in. This woman had been a Presbyterian. And when I sat down, she says, I know that God's sovereign and that God gave me this sickness for a reason. And I've just been trying to glorify God. And so I started just countering her doctor and I said, God didn't make you sick. God didn't do this. And I rejected that and made her reject it. And then I just started telling her all these things. I spent about 45 minutes ministering to her and telling her that God doesn't control these things, that it's God's will that she be well and that she has to take her authority. So anyway, after I ministered to her, then I prayed for her. I sat on a table because she couldn't move. And I sat on a table in front of her and grabbed her hands and I prayed for her. And I commanded that pain to leave her. And instantly, her pain was gone. She took this blanket off. She stood up and she started moving around. And for the first time in nine years, she is totally pain-free. And she started just praising God. But then she says, but I still have a burning right here in my waist, in the back. Why didn't it leave? And I said, you didn't tell me you had a burning. I didn't talk to burning. I said, I spoke to pain. I said, watch this. And I commanded burning to leave. And the burning was gone instantly. And so then I took this passage of Scripture and I said, now, if you ever have another pain, or if you ever have this burning come back, it doesn't mean that you weren't healed. It doesn't mean that you lost your healing. It's just that the devil knows I mean what I say. And he flees for me. But he'll try you. He'll knock on the door. And if you have a pain, it doesn't mean you weren't healed. It's just a knock on the door. The devil trying to get back into your life. And if you say, oh, no, I wasn't healed, or oh, no, I lost my healing, then you open up the door and you let this thing back in. But all you got to do is do what I did and just speak and command pain or burning to leave your body and it'll obey you. And this woman just received it. So anyway, I spent nearly an hour with her by the time everything was done. And as she was getting ready to leave, she put her hand on the doorknob and she turned around and looked at me and she says, the burning is back. And I said, well, I've just been teaching you what to do. And I said, I'm not going to pray for you, but I'm going to let you pray. I'll join hands and you pray. And you got to remember that this woman an hour before was a Presbyterian. <laughs> believing that God made her sick and all this stuff. So she prayed a pretty good prayer for a lady that had been a Presbyterian an hour before. And she, this is nearly exactly what she said. She said, Father, I thank you that you did not give me this. You did not make me sick. It is not your will. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. I claim my healing. I am healed in the name of Jesus. You know, most people would think, yay, what a great prayer. That's not what God told her to pray. And so I said, so how are you? And she says, I've still got the burning. And I said, do you know why? And she says, no, what's wrong? And I said, because you didn't pray what God told you to pray. That's how most people pray. But that's not what the Lord told her to do. And she says, what did I not do? And I said, you didn't talk to the burning. You talked to God. You confessed your faith. You said it was his will for you to be healed. And you said great things. Those are good things to say. But you did not take your authority. You did not speak to the problem and command it to leave. And she says, you mean I'm supposed to say burning in the name of I'm supposed to talk to burning? And I said, yes, that's exactly what I mean. She says, I'll do it. And so we joined hands again. And she goes, burning in the name of Jesus. And that's as far as she got. She says, it's gone. That was awesome. That was back in 2001. And that woman has had a few things come back and knock on her door. She spoke to him. And you know what? She's been totally pain free 
and uh, set free from this ever since then. And it's just a classic example. This woman was saying good things. Her theology had changed. She was doing good things. But she wasn't taking her authority and speaking to the problem. Most people talk to God about their problem instead of talking to their problem about God. Most people will say, oh God, I'm poor. Would you please pour out your power? I believe that by, you know, that you supply my need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And you'll quote scripture and you'll do all this, but you don't take your authority. You need to stand and speak and say, in the name of Jesus, bills, I command you to be paid. I command poverty to get out of my life. Poverty, you leave me. I command this fear out of my life. Fear, I speak to you in Jesus' name, and you are not going to dominate me. This is what the Lord told us to do, is speak to our problem. Whatever it is that your problem, talk to it. And I know some of you are thinking, this is strange. This is weird. How can I talk to my toe? I promise you, talk to it. It'll respond. Say, toe in the name of Jesus, you are healed. Itch in the name of Jesus, I command you out of my life. Talk to it. And again, I remind you of Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can use your words for death or for life. You can sit there and say, I take my authority. And right now, in the name of Jesus... Cancer, I curse you. I kill you with my words. I speak death over you. Cancer, you will not live in this body. You have no authority in this body. You cannot dominate me. And if you believe it with your heart, you will have what you say. So curse cancer. Curse the sickness. Curse the infirmity. Curse the itch, the botch, whatever it is. Speak to it and then release life. And say, Father, I release your supernatural healing. I speak life over my body. Body, you are healed in the name of Jesus. You are recovering. And you speak to yourself. Man, this is simple. And yet so many Christians miss this. Again, I, I praise God for you that have come out and have devoted a weekend to coming and sitting under the Word. You are bound to be the fanatics. And yet, I can guarantee you the majority of people in here, when it comes time to pray, you go to God and tell Him your need, and you ask as if you have nothing to do about it. You have no control, no authority. You come as a totally passive person asking God to do it for you instead of understanding that God has already placed His power on the inside of you, and it's up to you to release the healing power of God. He gave you His Word. You can speak it in faith. And if you don't doubt, but if you believe what you say comes to pass, then you can have what you say. And you have to take your authority and you have to speak to your problem. Man, that's powerful. If you could understand this, it would revolutionize the way you pray. And you know what? Um... This will make you so that it's hard to fit in to a lot of Christian stuff. You'll get to where you can't tolerate the way that people pray and the way that they beg God to do stuff that he's already done. And he gave us authority to do. And this is going to make you a misfit. This is going to ruin you. But I guarantee you, you'll start getting results. You'll start seeing the power of God and manifestation. And if you speak to something and it doesn't come to pass, it's either because it's in the process. Jesus spoke to the fig tree and some people would have looked at that and said, see, nothing happened. No, it happened. It happened at the roots. It just took a period of time for it to be manifest. Either you're in that process or you don't believe that what you're saying is coming to pass. So how do you deal with that? You just keep saying it. You just keep saying it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And if you keep saying it long enough, you'll eventually go to believing it. You know, I told you that I was supposed to have glasses when I was a kid. And I started speaking over it and believing and my eyes improved. And they had been good. But I'd say 
two or three years ago, I could tell that my eyes weren't as good as they were. And you know what I began to do? I just began every morning when I got up and got ready, I would talk to my eyes. And I did that for a solid year. Just saying, eyes, you are healed. You have supernatural vision. Moses was 120 years old. His natural force wasn't abated or his eyesight dim. He had an inferior covenant. I've got a better covenant. Eyes, you are healed. I can see. And I just would speak it over myself. And did you know what? And I don't even know when it happened. But one day I just realized, boy, I'm seeing a lot better than I was seeing. I don't even know when it happened. But you know what? My eyes got better by me just speaking it. Sometimes we make a mistake to put a date on it and say, all right, I'm going to trust God for the next week. And if it doesn't come within a week, I quit and give up. You know, the devil knows where your heart is in this. And if you've got seven days that you're going to stand and believe God, then he'll fight you for eight. But if he knows that it doesn't matter, you're just going to say it and you're going to believe it and it doesn't matter how long it takes. You're, this is what you believe and you're going to do it. The devil knows that there's no give up in you and he'll just tuck tail and run and you'll get it easier. But there's a lot of people that are just going to try it. The devil can tell whether you're trying it or whether you really believe it. And sometimes you don't know. You think you're doing it, but you know what? Your heart's not established. But if you keep saying something over and over and over and over and over, it becomes established in your life. This is why, even though you may jest and say things that you don't mean, and you say, well, I wasn't believing that in my heart, you know, but you just, you're just always talking death. You know, you're just, well, we're just joking. It's our 40th birthday, so we're going to give black balloons and we're going to talk about I'm over the hill and we're going to start giving you preparation H and we're going to start, do you know what that is over here? And we're going to start giving you all of these things associated with old age and all of it. And you're just making jokes and, oh, I don't mean it. Well, because you didn't believe it, then you don't fall over dead and, all, and it doesn't happen. But you know what? It's still not good to just go speaking negative. I wouldn't do things like that. Because even though you don't believe it with your heart, if you say it over and over and over and over and over, it begins to impact your life. The words that you speak have either life or death in it. And so you need to get to where you control your words, even when it's something that you aren't serious about. You know, I still tell jokes. I'm not saying that you can't tell a joke. I may be wrong. <laughs> I don't know. But I still tell jokes. I still have a good time. But I let people know that it's a joke. I don't lead them on and, and lie to them and stuff like that. And so I'm not saying that you can. You know, the scripture talks about jesting, which is not convenient. There's a right and a wrong way to jest. But you need to get to where you are serious as a heart attack when it comes to speaking that you hold to the words that you speak. Amen? And let me just put a little uh, parenthesis on this. I'm trying to wind everything up and tie it all together. Let me say that you shouldn't go to saying negative things. Like if the doctor says that you're going to die, I wouldn't, con I wouldn't confess it. I wouldn't go tell people what the doctor said. Even though I don't believe it, I'm still not going to repeat it. I mentioned this earlier, the scripture out of Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 6, where it says, take no thoughts saying. When you begin to speak thoughts, speak things out of your mouth, it begins to start having influence in your life. So I wouldn't repeat negative things. I avoid doing it. But you know, sometimes you have to say, Certain thing. Like, for instance, look over here in John chapter 11. Let me show you this. This is Jesus when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And in John chapter 11, they uh, sent messengers to Jesus to tell him that his friend Lazarus was dead. And Jesus intentionally stayed there two more days. And then he says, let's go back. And so... As you add all of this up, by the time Jesus got the message, Lazarus was already dead. And he said later in this instance, right here in John chapter 11, he says, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there so that I could raise Lazarus from the dead. So he said in that statement that had he have been there, he wouldn't have let Lazarus die. But he knew 
by the Spirit that when he got this message, Lazarus was already dead, so there was nothing to lose. He just waited another two days, and by the time he got there, Lazarus had been dead for four days. So, anyway, this is the background. And he told his disciples, he says, let's go back into Judea. And the disciples just couldn't believe it. They said, man, they tried to kill you last time you were there. I can't believe that you're going back. And he told them, he says, there's 12 hours in the day. If you walk in the light, you won't stumble. But if you walk in the night, you will stumble. In other words, he was saying, this is what God is telling me to do. And I'm going to follow the leading of God. And I'm safer doing what God tells me to do than just following carnal logic and wisdom. So then he said in John chapter 11, verse 11, he says, After these things, or these things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Albeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. So the scripture explains very clearly that Lazarus was dead. Jesus knew Lazarus was dead. But when he told his disciples, he says, we're going to go back and wake Lazarus up. He's asleep and I'm going to wake him up. Why would Jesus say that when he knew that Lazarus was dead? I believe it's because of this exact principle that I've been talking about. Words are powerful. Words convey things. And to most people, the word death is final. Man, once a person is dead, it's over. We have wrong impression about death. What Jesus said is actually much more accurate. A person, when they die, they don't cease to exist. Their body just quits functioning. Their spirit and their soul goes to be with the Lord, is what it says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's really like going down. You go to sleep, you become unconscious when you wake up. You're in heaven. So this was actually a very accurate way. And I believe that the Lord chose his words because he didn't want the doubt and the unbelief that the word dead or death would have produced in his disciples. You can go back to the sixth chapter of Mark, verse five, and it says Jesus could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. Even though Jesus was operating in the power of God perfectly, the unbelief of other people affects what I can do. It affected what Jesus could do. I'm saying some important things here. Most people don't know this. You know, when you get sick or something, when you have a need, you know what the typical person does? Call the prayer chain at church and get a hundred people to agree and pray. That's one of the worst things you can do. Because the majority of prayer change, what they're going to do, they'll pray a prayer and say, oh, God, heal this person. But then as they call the next person to alert the prayer change, oh, so-and-so's dying. They're going to be dead. And they speak all of these words of death. And they really believe those. And then they'll pray and say, Lord, heal him if it be your will for Jesus. (laughs) Man, you just multiplied your problem by a hundred people when you call the prayer change. Jesus was casting the demon out of this demon-possessed boy. And when he saw the multitude come running together, he cast them out real quick. Because he didn't want all that unbelief in there. And yet most people, they just tell everybody their problem. And they, they say, how are you doing? Oh, the doctor says I'm dying. And oh, my back hurts and my rheumatism acting up today. And you just speak death, death, death. You speak all these negative things. Even Jesus in his hometown couldn't perform many mighty works because of the unbelief of other people. He didn't want his 12 disciples to know that Lazarus was dead because that would mean that they would immediately think, well, it's over. There would be unbelief. He would have to deal with it. He was going to have plenty of unbelief to deal with when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He didn't want to say this to his disciples. So he said, he's asleep. But when the disciples misunderstood what he was saying, he did tell them that he is dead. In verse 14, Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. It is not wrong for you to state the natural truth, the natural fact, as long as you don't make that the end. As long as you don't say, well, that's just all that there is to it. 
I would avoid stating it. If the doctor told me that I had cancer, that I was dying, I wouldn't go around telling everybody. I wouldn't stand up at a meeting like this and tell everybody what I had because all of your unbelief would affect things. I would not go around confessing that. But if somebody that I trusted and I wanted their prayer in agreement, I could tell I could tell them the natural facts as long as I don't leave it there, as long as I counter it with the greater spiritual truth. Because look what Jesus said. He said, Lazarus is dead. But he didn't just stop right there. He didn't just say, well, Lazarus is dead. No, he said, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you might believe. Nevertheless, let us go on to him. In other words, he put a positive spin on it. He spoke a negative truth, but then he countered it with the greater spiritual truth. Sometimes you have to tell people that there's a problem. Like, say, for instance, if you have this huge growth on the side of your neck and you're telling people, I believe I'm healed in the name of Jesus. And people look at you and say, but you've got this huge growth. I've heard people before say, I don't have a growth. I don't see a growth. There isn't a growth of my neck. That's, that's not faith. That's denial. That's just ignorance. If you got a growth, you got a growth. But I would agree that you shouldn't go around talking and telling people about it. But if somebody sees it and says, look, I don't care what you say, you got a growth. It would be okay to say, look, I see that, but I also see that by the stripes of Jesus I am healed. It's not wrong to state what is true in the natural as long as you counter it with the greater spiritual truth that you're believing. But even at that, I wouldn't be quick to speak out the natural because every time you speak it, you're taking those thoughts. You're speaking forth these things. So I do agree that you shouldn't just go around telling everybody your problems. You shouldn't in prayer. There's so many people that call it prayer and all it is is complaining. They go to God, no, oh, God, the doctor says this, oh, God, I heard, oh, God, I'm, I remember dear old Aunt Susie died of this same thing. And you spend 45 minutes praying like that and wonder why you aren't getting any better. Charles Capps said he was praying like that one time and the Lord stopped him right in the midst and said, Charles, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm praying. He says, you aren't praying, you're complaining. And there's a lot of us that all what we call prayer is nothing but complaining. You're just telling God all of your problems. God has, he knows what you need before you even come to him. Prayer is not an opportunity to inform, poor, misinform God of your situation and tell him how bad it is. You don't need to gripe and complain and tell him all of this rotten stuff. Man, you need to speak faith. And so don't in prayer even do this. You know, lots of people... They'll come and they'll say, well, I shouldn't say this. I know I shouldn't. They don't want me to say this, but I'm saying this so that we can pray. That's the way they hide everything so that they can gossip and feel good about it. And there's some of you that just think in prayer, it's an opportunity for you to say anything. You shouldn't speak unbelief in your prayer. You shouldn't glorify the devil. You shouldn't repeat all of the bad things that the devil is doing. I'm telling you, there's power in your words. So use your words to believe and speak the word of God and believe that you receive. But if you are in a situation where people don't understand, say, for instance, you're in a marriage where your husband or your wife thinks you're absolutely crazy for sitting there saying that you're healed when anybody can tell that you're sick and they think that you've lost your mind and they're going to commit you to a mental institution. Then you could tell them, says, look, I understand that here's what the doctor said. I understand exactly how serious you can speak all of the things. Let them know you haven't lost your mind. And then just tell them, but I believe by the stripes of Jesus I'm healed. And that spiritual truth, the truth, will counter the facts. This may be a fact, but here is the truth. So sometimes you have to say, here's this, but I believe this. Most people, the way they do it is say, well, here's what the Word says, but here's what I feel and here's what the doctor says. It really just depends on where you put your butt. You need to make sure that you always say, well, here's the facts, but 
I believe in the name of Jesus, I'm healed, amen. And you just need to counter those negative things with the positive truths of God's Word. Look over in Isaiah chapter 54. And I wish I had time to put all of this in its proper context. Isaiah 53 is the chapter where Jesus bore our sorrows, carried our griefs. By His stripes we are healed. And in Isaiah 54, it just enumerates the different benefits that we get as a result of our salvation. It says in verse 9 and 10 that He'll never be angry with us nor rebuke us ever again. What a radical truth. Most Christians do not understand that. And it just continues to start talking about all of these things. And look in verse 17. It says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Boy, a powerful passage of Scripture. And notice it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. I believe that there's a linkage here. He's talking about weapons formed against you, and then he starts talking about words. Words are Satan's weapons. They are his arrows that he shoots against you. He speaks words to you. And the sad thing is, most of us pay big bucks to have television piped into our house and have all of these words of the devil delivered at us. Words of fear about the economy, about this plague. You know, I've made this point before. I know I just beat a dead horse. Some of you think this. But it was over here in England when they prophesied the leading expert in the British health care system prophesied and said it is not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when The avian flu. Do you call it avian or bird flu? It was opposite in the U.S. and I forget which. Anyway, this avian or bird flu, he said it's just a matter of when it mutates and it will kill. He said it might be one or two years, but within two years, the leading expert in Britain over the whole health care system prophesied and said one third of the world's population will die by avian flu. That was in 2007. And two years later, there had been a total of 12 human deaths worldwide. It was an absolute lie. It was a false prediction. It was wrong. And you know what? Many Christians, there's probably people right in here that had fear, anxiety, worry over some of those things that was completely unbased. It was untrue. And we hear stuff like that all of the time. All of the time. They are making predictions. They're saying things. You have fear and your heart is troubled. We, words are weapons against us. You need to protect yourself. And yet most people will plop themselves down in front of the television and listen to words that are contrary to everything you believe. They'll talk about some plague. It's flu season. It's this. It's that. And the Word of God says that He heals all of your sickness and all of your diseases. And yet you just let these words come at you and don't even think about it. Words are weapons. Satan is getting to you and affecting your values and your faith by words. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God brings faith. Anything contrary to the word of God, those words bring unbelief and doubt and fear. There's a reason why we're so dead to God and so full of unbelief. Because we live in a culture of unbelief that speak negative and speak unbelief. And most of us just let these words come at us, not understanding that they are weapons. He said, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. You need to recognize words are powerful and Satan is hurting your faith through all of the negative words that come your way. People will say things as you're leaving. Well, take care when the Bible says, be careful for nothing. I have people say that to me. They say, well, take care. And I said, for nothing. 
People always wonder what's going on. But you know what? That's a small thing. And again, the only reason you don't just immediately fall apart is because you don't believe it with your heart. But when you just speak things contrary to God's word, after a while, your heart gets confused. Your heart doesn't believe that the words you say come to pass because words don't mean that much to you. You need to get to where you believe and you evaluate words and you don't let negative words be spoken over you. And you know, there's a lot of people that just, you aren't willing to fight over this. It's not that big of a deal. This will make you stand out in a crowd. I've been in church before where they stand up and prophesy, Thus saith the Lord, I am angry. Yea, I am upset with you. When the Lord said he'd never be angry with us nor rebuke us. And I had to stand up and say, no, according to the word of God, he'll never be angry with me. And I counter those words. There's a lot of you who wouldn't do that. And you know what? Every time you listen to a person speak things you know to be contrary to the word of God, your heart, you feel it in your heart. You're grieved in your heart. And yet many of you will sit there and let people speak negative things, lies over you. And it confuses your heart. And after a while, your heart thinks, well, he doesn't believe what he says. He doesn't stand by what he says. You can't keep negative words from coming. We, even if you quit listening to all of the wrong TV and all of the stuff and quit reading the magazines and the newspaper, and even if you did all that, you're still going to hear some Junk. You're, you live in the world, and we are going to hear some contrary stuff. How do you deal with it? Right here it says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, you shall condemn. To me, this is the key right here. As much as you can, quit listening to things that corrupt you. And somebody says, well, I can do, I can watch these movies and I can listen to this stuff and I'm just strong enough. It doesn't corrupt me. First Corinthians 15, 33 says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you're saying I'm strong enough and it doesn't bother me, you are deceived. I happen to believe the word of God more than I believe you. And you say, I'm not deceived. I'm strong enough. It doesn't hurt me. The Bible says you're deceived if you think that. Evil communications don't corrupt good manners. You're deceived. Quit listening to it. How do you do that? Well, as much as you can, withdraw yourself from it. Take a stand. But you still are going to be exposed to some stuff just because we live in a negative world. So how do you deal with those things? You condemn it. It says every weapon that uh, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. You have to condemn it. The word condemn means judge it. Say that, no, this is wrong. You know, the way I listen to the news primarily is I have an hour's drive into the office and I turn on the radio because they give you two or three minute sound bites of news. Rather than watching 30 minutes on television and have to deal with all of those lies and deception, I just deal with two or three minutes. And uh, even doing that, they'll come on and say, it's flu season. Have you gotten your flu shot yet? And you can ask Jamie. We'll be driving along and I'll say, no, it's not flu season for me in the name of Jesus. By his stripes, I'm healed. There is never a time that the word of God doesn't work. Every time a commercial comes on for something that is about sickness and disease and about getting older and whatever it is, I'll sit there and I'll talk to it. I'll condemn it. I'll say, that's not for me. I don't believe in this. I don't believe in that stuff. He'll say, take care. And I'll say, for nothing. Man, I just don't listen to stuff like that. And I counter it. And I found that if I counter it right then, if I deal with it the moment I hear it, it's like that seed never gets on the inside of me. It never starts putting down roots. It, it just is, it rolls off my back. But if I, for whatever reason, or am afraid, or I, I'm, I don't want to offend somebody, so I won't say something, and I just kind of let it 
I don't say anything. Did you know I get home and that thing has already started taking root on the inside of me and I have to get into the word and start praying and countering it may take me 15 or 20 minutes or an hour to get that unbelief, that negative thing I was, that was spoken in me out. And so I've just learned to counter things when I hear it. I speak something right then. I know some of you think, man, I, I can't imagine how I would apply this in my life. Some of you live with a person that just speaks negative all of the time. I don't know how to apply it to your situation, but the principle is here. If you just let things go, then it's going to cause problems in your life. You have to get to where when you hear negative words that contradict what God's word says, you have to speak and condemn it right then. And if you do that, it just solves a lot of problems. You know, my mother had um, a hyperthyroid. And she took thyroid medication her entire life from the time she was a little girl until she was in her 80s. And she heard me talking about these things. And she started trying to believe God. And she was trying to believe God for her healing. But she just was really struggling with this. And... and uh, Anyway, one night I remember talking to her. I talked to her for two or three hours and finally just prayed with her. And I remember going in and looking on a calendar and she wrote on this calendar, From this time on, I will stand on the Word of God and by His stripes I'm healed. And she threw away her medication and she was fine. And for a month or two, my mother was just doing really good and seeing healings and things happen. And then she went to visit my aunt that raised her. And I told her, I said, Mother, when you go down there to visit my aunt, I said, all you do is talk about who's died lately. You catch up on who's dead, who's got this sickness, and you talk sickness and you talk death. And I said, I, I understand that you're interested in these people, but I said, you're going to have to counter it and start speaking that this isn't the way it has to be, that by the stripes of Jesus we were healed. I sure wish that they understood that they could believe God and be healed instead of just stay sick. You're going to have to start speaking the Word of God over this, or this will counter the stand that you've taken in faith. And I remember my mother telling me, but she raised me. This is the woman that raised me. I can't show disrespect to her. And I said, you can do it as nice as you want to do it, but you've got to do it. You gotta stand. You gotta speak against that stuff. And my mother said, I'm just not sure that I can do it. And so sure enough, she went down to visit her and by the time she got back, she had a cold. She was sick and she says, I just couldn't do it. And so Jamie and I, and at that time we had our first son. He was only a, a few months old. We were going on a trip. And we went on this trip and my mother was so upset with herself. And she knew what had happened. And she just gave up even trying to speak the word and stuff. She just was really discouraged. And so the very first day, I had Joshua sitting on my lap. And the air conditioning was blowing on him. And she says, oh, don't sit in there. He'll get a cold. And I said, no, he will not get a cold in the name of Jesus. I countered those words, just like what I'm talking about. And then she says, oh, don't let him around me. He'll catch my cold. And I said, no, he's not going to catch your cold. I said, we don't believe in that. And I just countered everything she said. And it was like this all day long, just fighting back and forth. And we got into a motel room that night, and we all stayed in the same motel room. Jamie and I were in one bed. My mother was in a bed. And then we had a little uh, rollaway bed that we put Joshua in. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, he woke up with a cold and this rasp in his voice. You could hear him breathing in the next room. It was really bad. And so I got up and I'd pray over him in tongues and rebuke this and he'd be fine. I'd put him down and within 30 minutes or an hour, he'd be back up with this thing. And I did that for two or three times, up and down. And the lights were off while I was doing this, but everybody in the room could hear me praying over him. And so the last time I prayed over him and he was okay, he was breathing okay, I put him back down. I was headed to my bed and the lights were off, and my mother just said, Admit it, Andy, he's sick. (laughs) 
And you know, I'm not saying that you have to do things the way I did. Hopefully you are more mature than I was. But you know what? What you got to do the same thing I did, maybe with more tact. But even though it was dark, I got right down in my mother's face and I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I break your curse. I command this stuff to stop. I will not receive your death spoken over my child. And I told the devil where to go. And did you know that Joshua never woke up again during the night, never had a cold, never had a cough anymore. It was over. And on six days of vacation, my mother never spoke to me. And finally, I just said, say something. And she says, I'm sorry you think I'm the devil. And I told her, I said, Mother, I don't think you... It's the same thing that Jesus did with Peter when he said, Satan, get behind me. You know, some people don't understand that in the 16th chapter of Matthew. But Jesus had just prophesied that I am going to be crucified, but the third day I will rise again. And Peter said, that be far from you, Lord. We aren't going to let anybody take you. Did you know most people would think, well, wasn't that nice what he said? No, it was contrary to what God had told him. It was statements of unbelief. And Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus didn't want to die in the natural. And for somebody to speak something that would feed his flesh... And encourage him that, no, you don't have to do it this way. There's bound to be another way. That was unbelief. And Jesus turned right around and said, get behind me, Satan, because you savor not the things that be of God. Some people wonder why he was so hard with Peter. It's because those words were weapons. Those words were coming against his heart and tempting him not to fulfill what God told him to do. And he recognized that those were weapons against him. And he would not accept any word contrary. Most of you won't get be that strong. And that's the reason you're going to be sick. I hate to say it that way, but I'm just telling you that's the way it is. But you need to get to a place where, praise God, you've got the Word of God. And if Satan counters you, you're going to counter him. And you know what? I'm as gentle as I can be with people. If a person just barely touches me like this, I'll just barely say something. They'll say, take care, and I'll say for nothing. And that's enough, and I'll let it go. But if they come and say, you're dying, aren't you worried about this? If they push me, I'll push back with equal strength. It's just like if I'm standing here and somebody comes up and just barely bumps into me, I don't have to do much. But if they come running and try and bowl me over, man, I'll put a lot of effort into that so I can stay on my feet. I will counter the unbelief that comes at me with an equal amount of strength. I went and got a physical for my uh, insurance. We had to have insurance on this building that we've got. So they sent me to the doctor to get a physical and I did one of these treadmill tests. And in retrospect, I made a mistake because they wanted to shave the hair on my chest and put these things on me. And I said, this is virgin hair. It's never been touched. (laughs) And so anyway, I talk them out of shaving the hair on my chest. And they stuck these things on my chest. And about 12 or 13 minutes into the test, I was sweating. And these things started falling off of me. And so I was holding two of them. A nurse was holding two of them. A doctor was holding two of them. And here I was doing this treadmill test. And anyway, I had witnessed to him, told him about my son being raised from the dead and all these things. And so the doctor was looking through this paper, and I think it was 12 minutes and 32 seconds into the test, which you didn't even have to go the full 15 minutes. I went the full 15 minutes. They said you could have quit at 10. But anyway, I, at 12 minutes and 32 seconds, he saw something, and he started grunting and, mm, and you know, doing all these doctor-type things. And... Um, he says, man, you got a serious problem here. And he started writing out a name and an address. And he says, I want you to go straight to this doctor's office. Don't you go back to your office. You go over there. You get this tested. And says, we're going to put you in the hospital. We might do open heart surgery on you by the time, by tonight. And I just kind of stood there shaking my head for a second, trying to process all of this. And I just said, that's a lie. I don't believe that. 
And this doctor, doctors aren't used to having a patient tell them they lied. <laughs> this doctor was just, he was just shy. He looked at me and said, what are you saying? I said, that's a lie. I don't have anything wrong with my heart. I said, you look at that piece of paper and tell me that that says I've got a serious heart problem. And he said, well, it doesn't really say that. It just, you were a one hundredth of a point off right here. And he says, everybody's heart's different. You could be perfectly normal, but I think we ought to go check, check it and make sure that there isn't something wrong. And I said, that's not what you said. You said I had a serious heart problem and that I might have open heart surgery before the day is over. I said, you lied to me. You didn't say there is a possibility. Of, and this guy started, well, I just thought it was wise that we need to check this out. I said, that's not what you said. I said, you lied to me. And man, I countered this. I said, I reject this stuff in the name of Jesus. And did you know that doctor, he finally just tore that piece of paper up and he says, you're fine. Leave. And I got out of there. And did you know he flunked me and I couldn't get insurance because of that? And I had to go and there's a guy on my board who's a doctor and he put me through one of these nuclear tests where they inject you with the dye and you do this thing. And and the person that gave me that test said, did you know that those treadmill tests are only right 50% of the time? Half the time they're wrong. He said, nobody should trust one of those tests. He says, this nuclear test is 99 point something percent right. And they checked me out and I had the heart of a 17 year old. There wasn't any problem. But how many of you, if a doctor says, you're going to die, you got this, we may have to do open heart surgery. I'm just amazed at the people that go in and let a doctor just tell you stuff and you do whatever they say. I know that some of you are not liking this. But I'm telling you, this is how you're going to have to get. If you believe that what you say comes to pass, you're going to have to get to where you just don't cave at the first word that is contrary to what you're believing. You're going to have to get to where you condemn those words and you refuse to allow people to speak negative words over you. And if you aren't willing to do that, then just enjoy your sickness. Just enjoy your poverty. Just enjoy your miserableness. Because I'm telling you, this is the way you've got to be. Jesus, when somebody countered what he was believing, said, Get behind me, Satan. Amen. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go out and be offensive and mean to people. I I believe I probably could have dealt with my mother better than I did. But you know what? That was when I was first getting established. And when you're young, it's like a little tiny plant. It just can't withstand very much. You have to put it in a greenhouse. And it needs a controlled environment to be able to grow. Once it becomes a huge oak, it might be able to withstand a hurricane. And all kinds of cold weather and different extremes and stuff. But when it's young, you've got to protect it. And I was young and I had to protect that seed that God had put in me. And that's just the way I did it. It may not have been the right way, but it's the way I did it. And you know what? It worked. And my mother eventually got over it. We were best friends. Had a great time with my mother. She just died in 2009 at 96 years old. But my mother was just an awesome lady. We got along great. We got over it. But I tell you what, you've got to get to a place. It says in Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. That's the way you got to be. I think I'm supposed to be through. (laughs) They're giving me a sign that says zero. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Father, I take these truths about the power of your word, the power of our words, the power of faith-filled words. And I speak them in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit helps people to receive these words into their heart and mix them with faith. 
and then speak them back out of their mouth and be strong. And not allow the devil to shoot all of these weapons, these negative words at us. Father, I just thank you that there's going to be a change in our lifestyle, that we will not go back into the same lifestyle we came from. That, Father, we will create a godly atmosphere with our words, faith-filled atmosphere. That we will speak the Word of God. We will mean what we say and say what we mean. And that we will have whatsoever we say. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus. And so we receive it in the mighty name of the Lord. For more of Andrew's teaching and other resources, please visit our website at awmi.net. Or for prayer and additional information, call our helpline at 719-635-1111. Again, that's 719-635-1111. Em đến với anh vào một ngày trời đẹp nắng, một ngày phượng hồng. Oh